Are you a healthcare professional looking for a trusted concussion resource? Then you've come to the right place. From her New York City studios, welcome to Concussion Corner with your host, Dr. Jessica Schwartz. Welcome to the Concussion Corner podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Jessica Schwartz, and I'm thrilled to have our guest back, Dr. Jeffrey Kutcher, on part two of Concussion Management and the Neurologist. Dr. Kutcher is a leader in promoting the message that concussion is a clinical diagnosis only, innovating and advocating on an international level, creating new pathways to shift the trajectory of care for how we collaborate and care for our concussion patients of today. And Dr. Kutcher has a CV for days, but quite frankly, it's fascinating. He deserved all of it. So here we go. Dr. Kutcher currently serves as global director of the Sports Neurology Clinic, specializing in the diagnosis and management of sport concussion, post-concussive syndrome, and neurological conditions in athletes. Prior to this, he formed the first fellowship in sports neurology at the University of Michigan Neurosport Program. He is the team neurologist for the United States ski and snowboard team and served as the team neurologist for the U.S. Olympic team in, 2000, in the 2014 Games in Sochi, Russia. In February, he will be uh, attending the U.S. Olympic team uh, as a, their physician again uh, in Pyeongchang, South Korea. He also serves as a director of the NBA concussion program and has helped develop the concussion policies of the NCAA, as well as several college athletic programs and conferences. Presently, he is also an advisor to the NFL, NHL, and Major League Soccer Players Associations. He has led the effort to create the Sports Neurology Section of the American Academy of Neurology and has served as, its, as the section's first chair, and we were lucky to have him and still are. He was also a co-founding co-director. He was a founding co-director of the annual American Academy of Neurology Sports Concussion Conference, and he is an author of um, a recent book, Back in the Game, Why Concussion Doesn't Have to End Your Athletic Career. Dr. Kutcher, welcome back to Concussion Corner. Well, thank you, Jess, so much, and, and thank you for all that you do as well. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. And, you know, it's such a small world that we live in. So I think most of us are kind of attending the same conferences these days. And it's, it's so nice to see the, you know, familiar faces out there. But also what's, you know, what's consistent is the benevolence of everyone out there that's just willing to give and serve this uh, population of patients. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. This is an area that you, you have to be passionate about if, if you want to uh, do good work here. And it's not something we make a lot of money doing. So uh, it's something that, that most folks that I know are in it for the right reasons. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm quite the, I'm like an in-between Gen X and the millennial. And I went to, um, I watched Fixer Upper on HGTV. And I have to say, um, I visited the Magnolia, you know, farms down in Waco, Texas. And uh, I'm not sure if you're, you're familiar with that show, but essentially I picked up uh, this leather good. And it's funny that you just said that it's on my desk and it says, do good work today. Um, and I think if we live by that model, I think, you know, you're, you're, we're here to serve as clinicians. Yeah, that's, that's perfect. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, again, so our listeners, again, are an interdisciplinary international group right now um, for, you know, in healthcare. And I just kind of want to kick it off before we get into all the Olympic chat um, about the challenges and, and, and benefits of all of the above. Um, about essentially what the role of neurology and concussion management is. We'll kind of kick it off there, and then we'll take the listener through some clinical uh, conversations. Sure. Uh, thanks, Jess. I think, you know, the most important thing I want to point out is taking care of concussions, whether you're on the sidelines, you're you know, in the training rooms, in the clinics, uh, or wherever you may be, uh, takes many different professions. Uh, and obviously, everybody has uh, different experiences and training to bring to uh, all of these issues. You know, neurologists, what, what we bring to the table is a comprehensive uh, viewpoint of brain health from you know injury, disease, normal function. Uh, you know the, we, we hear all the time that you know people who are in this uh, field, you know that, that this is a newer field that you know neurologists didn't didn't know much about concussion ten years ago. Well, you know the, the, the reality is nobody really did, but neurologists uh, do understand all the things that go along with concussion. Uh, so headaches and memory problems and attention issues and sleep issues. These are things that are our bread and butter. Uh, mm -hmm. And so to be able to bring that level of, I would say, comprehensive approach uh, where you do, you know, a, a formal, organized and critical neurological history, not just a symptom checklist. I think that level of thought is what our patients deserve. And, and that's what I hope our neurologists bring to this conversation. 
Indeed. And I think that's for all of our, our healthcare providers, you know, in the rehab field and even our, your, your colleagues that are also physicians, you know, across the table from PM&R to primary care, um, even urgent care and our ED friends and colleagues. Uh, you know, I think that's important to make sure that we understand that today in 2018, we really should be doing serial and comprehensive physical target examinations uh, on our concussion patients. You know, this is not, you know, um, a symptom checklist. And I think that's spot on. And I think that's where a lot of our patients historically and unfortunately present day are still kind of getting mismanaged is we're kind of doing these uh, post-concussive symptom scales, kind of checking things off and we're not doing um, physical exams. You know, I was wondering your thoughts, if you could share, you know, really what your process is. I know it goes anywhere from 60 minutes to three hours. So what's your process is out there. So folks kind of know what to look for when referring to or, or collaborating with a, a fellow neurologist. Well, sure. I mean, it starts with with very detailed information about the event that occurred or the series of events, that patient being in front of you, but also understanding what was going on with them, um, you know, sports career or anything that may be in the background occurring, um, sort of whether they play sports or get injured or not. Process and and to be able to tease out, you know, when you have multiple they interact with each other, how one may affect the other one. He's looking for common pathophysiology. Being able to put it all together with different mechanisms, whether it's a neck mechanism or primary sleep problem or migraine problem, in addition to concussion, or all wrapped up in the one post concussion syndrome, that takes a very uh, thoughtful, detailed approach. And I would say the first 30 to 45 minutes of any of our patient evaluations is really just talking to the patient and doing a good history. Um, and it's, it starts there, and then your, your examination, again, is never the same thing twice. If you're doing the same neuro exam twice, you're probably not doing it right. Uh, a good neurological examination starts by screening the areas that were brought to light by the history and then exploring those areas as much as you need to to be able to understand the pathology as, as best as you can. So uh, it's really not the same process twice, and, and that's something that I really think people should uh, take away from this. Indeed. And I know we're having some signal issues on your end, but I just want to recap, you know, really understanding um, and hop in any time here, uh, Jeff, um, because we, were, we lost you a little bit. So really understanding that pre-morbid history, um, essentially getting a, a, an exquisite subjective on these patients um, and then never doing that same neuro exam twice because, with that serial exam. Is, is that about about right? Yeah, that, that's exactly right, Jess. Great. Um you know, and essentially, you know, 2017, and I'm, you're very familiar with this, you know, uh, in our fifth international consensus statement, you know, and this is for the athlete. And again, we're speaking primarily about athlete, but we know that, you know, falls are the number one cause of TBI um, and folks are getting, you know, concussions from, you know, domestic violence incidents, falls, um, just getting hit on the head or struck by an object and motor vehicle collisions. Um, so we have to remember that we're doing a lot of our um a lot of our historically where this is coming from has derived from sport in the military, um, but we have to make sure we keep all of the above in mind when we're treating other patients. Um, 2017 was the first formal year that we've called this injury a rehabilitative injury. Um, who is kind of in your interdisciplinary camp, you know, for, for treatment, um, you know, when you're looking beyond medication for like migraine management and things like that? Well, I'll tell you, uh, every, pretty much every patient we see, uh, we will have evaluated by a physical therapist and an athletic trainer will help us uh, work that patient out and do a dynamic evaluation. So that's kind of where things start with us, neurologist, athletic trainer, physical therapist. We branch out from there as needed, whether mm -hmm. it's with neuropsychologists uh, or neurosurgeons or whatever the case may be. Uh, but that's, that's where our core begins. Yeah, and, and I totally respect that as well. And, you know, kind of four of that six trajectory is kind of based out of UPMC's, you know, um, they're not a clinical prediction guideline whatsoever, but you know, they're seeing about 20,000 and they're publishing similar to you, um, which is great for us that are in the trenches. Um, but if we're looking at, you know, uh, ocular motor issues, vestibular issues, um, even some post-traumatic headache and migraine issues from that COC3, you know, upper cervical spine, so important. Um, and vestibular ocular motor, um, oh, and the neck and the cervical spine, you know, for the six trajectories that they publish about and in not including exercise and autonomic dysfunction really kind of are up the physical therapist alley. So as a physio, of course, I am, you know, all for that, but it's so important to make sure that we're looking at all of these systems individually and then making sure that we're not just treating one thing. Um, you have to make sure that interplay is there. 
And, you know, I'm actually very glad you brought up that, that autonomic factor, because that is something that we look very closely at with all of our patients. You know, we start with a very simple orthostatic blood pressure screen, but we may go down a path that's much more detailed about autonomic dysfunction. Whether you're looking at an acute concussion day two, day three after an injury begins or, you know, post-concussion syndrome six months down the road. Indeed. And, and I think a lot of this stuff kind of rears its ugly head. And again, you know, we talked about kind of on our first podcast together, when we historically, when we don't know what to do in medicine with a patient, we kind of send them down two trajectories. We, we kind of allude that they may be malingering because, you know, I as clinician can't figure this out um, and may be frustrated. Uh, and we have to be aware of our own biases there. And then two, we kind of maybe send them to psych because they may be presenting with signs and symptoms of anxiety. But we also have to understand that all of those, you know, ocular motor, migraine, um, cervical spine, chronic pain, and uh, vestibular conditions all have an anxiety overlay of them. So we may have just been looking at something from a, di- a different lens and not realizing that they may be something somatic going on in, in the system. Yeah, I agree with that completely. And, and I think one of the messages that is important for not only care providers, but, but patients is to be aware of uh, clinicians who don't appreciate what they don't know or what mm-hmm. they're not good at uh, and, and just sort of either, you know, stay within their comfort zone uh, without admitting that they may not understand all these issues. Uh, that's really a bit of red flag for me. And I think a, a really important contributor to a lot of patients not getting better as they should. Indeed. And, you know, we're not, you know, not everybody is lucky to have you as their physician or clinician. Um, And I I do when I speak out there, you know, more often than not, we're not having the, you know, the Jeff Kutcher's out there in the world uh, clinically in healthcare. We often are having um, this very like unskilled and unaware clinician that thinks that they may know what's going on. So I often talk about the Dunning-Kruger effect when I speak in lecture for this very reason, because we have to make sure that this is not a, I, I don't know if I invented it or whatever, but I call it a degree bias, right? So, you know, just like you said, you know, earlier, it, no one knew about this injury, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago, the way in which we're looking at this now, from physician to PT and to everybody in between, all of our colleagues, you know, neuropsych and so on and so forth. Um, so the fact that we're A, calling this rehabilitative and B, um, we're kind of approaching this from a whole different lens these days. It's just it's wonderful to see, but we have to get the message out there. Yeah, I totally agree with that. So, so let's move on to, you know, kind of the exciting stuff. You're going to the Olympics um, in Pyeongchang, South Korea. Um, are you nervous? Any trepidations? All excited? What, what's going on for you there? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, this is my second Olympics, so I think mm-hmm. I, I know what to expect this time around, um, which is to expect the unexpected. And mm-hmm. It is re- really something that, you know, when I went to Sochi back in uh, four years ago, uh, what I was struck with was I had never worked harder in my life. From, from you know, every day was 16, 18 hour days, and I never wanted to do the same thing more the next day. So it was it was always a challenge, very dynamic environment. I um, mean, you name the the situation, it it, it just it's every every day is new, mm-hmm. and you have to be able to be comfortable in that uh, type of environment. So going into South Korea, I mean, you know, um, on sporting news aspect of it aside. Uh, I'm much more prepared than I was last year just to be in the proper mindset. So I'm say I'm nervous. I'm excited. Um, obviously, it's an honor um, mm-hmm. to represent the United States in, in that setting as a physician. But, you know, I'm clearly not there for myself. I'm not there to win medals. I'm not there to compete. I'm there for only one reason, and that's to take care of the health and safety of our athletes. Um, so I'm, I'm extremely excited. I've been waiting for this for four years, uh, ever since Sochi uh, closing ceremonies because it is an incredibly unique environment and one that just um, really changes you forever. Yeah, and, you know, I was honored to kind of participate in a lot of these um, uh, in some international play when I was a young kid. And we had the Maccabi Games when I was young, and it was so amazing to see folks Mm -hmm. from all over the world kind of come through. um, And you're just all there for the same reason, for the love of the the game. Um, And I think we often forget about our medical providers, too, that, you know, the, the benevolence and the kindness. And yes, these are super cool gigs you have there, um, but you're working your tail off. So I think that's something to connect to also as um, that people often forget that there are folks like you out there just making sure that our athletes are moving, you know, at hundreds of a second faster than than the person next door to them. And it's I think it's worth pointing out that the medical staff, the physicians, uh, we don't get paid for this. This is something that, mm-hmm. that we do. You know, we, we, we take three weeks away from our clinical and academic life um, to do this. And so, again, it, it really assures that the people you work with, your colleagues, the people next to you from every country um, are, are people that are there for the right reasons. 
Indeed. And, and I often say the same thing. I'm, I'm one of our national spokeswomen for the American Physical Therapy Association. And I'm like, listen, I'm only here because I love what I do. This is a figurehead position. So um, again, I, I feel like we have to remember that, you know, there's benevolence in medicine and um, that kindness and initial, you know, why we go into this, we want to help others. Um, a lot of that, you know, has to do with um, doing things on a volunteer basis. So it's, it's wonderful to give back and, and such, you know, high and low levels, you know, um, especially with, you know, um, volunteering uh, with concussion and brain injury, especially with women in domestic violence and kids who are in a lower socioeconomic area. It's just wonderful to give back. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you were talking about in our first podcast, um, talking about benevolence, right, is that you were actually surprised because you guys are coming with such skilled clinicians, right? You were actually surprised that um, a lot of the other countries were actually seeking your assistance. Maybe you could just talk about that a little bit and your experience with that. Sure. You know, I think there's... Um it's really a fantastic environment because of, of how the medical community comes together, really, whether, whether it's even, you know, during one event or over the course of the games. I mean, it's, it's important to understand that, you know, each country has sort of a different um, amount of resource that they, they put into this, that they can put into this. So the United States, we travel with a lot of physicians, a lot of athletic trainers, physical therapists. We have really a fantastic group uh, that covers all of our athletes. Well, you know, a, a country, and I won't name any, but uh, mm -hmm. with a, a very similar athlete footprint may travel with one third of the medical personnel that we have. Mm -hmm. So, you know, after a couple of days and, and being at the games, those countries understand that, hey, um, I, you know, <laughs> I need some help. Uh, so there were in, you know, instances where during a training session, I ended up sort of, you know, covering or keeping my eye on uh, athletes from four or five, six different countries while their physicians were off doing other things. And then as, as athletes get hurt, we, we look out for each other. Because I'm maybe the first person on scene uh, injury. I've been trained to handle those things as well, and not just a neurologist in that sense. Whether that's you know a patient from New Zealand or China or United States, it really builds this great spirit of, of everybody helping each other out. You know, it may sound a little cheesy, but uh, the, uh, to, to realize where uh, humanity needs to be. Indeed. And I, you know, I think as a spectator, I'm wearing my uh, Olympic sweatshirt for you today. And I did. I brought the uh, USA mitt that, that were sold out a few years ago. So I, I bought those this summer. I was ready. There was a sale and I was like all on it. So I'll be definitely cheering for you. And, and again, you know, thank you for your service. And I think we forget that we're called providers and we're and we call it a service. Right. Um, but I think we have to connect to that. We are, we're here to serve. So, you know, it's just a wonderful thing to see what you're doing. Yeah. And thanks for your support. The athletes appreciate it. Yep. So when we talk about, um, you know, Winter Olympics, right, we're thinking snowboard, skiing. Um, what are out there? What's out there that you're seeing that maybe, you know, misjudged in terms of um, the lay public or clinical community uh, in healthcare in terms of like high concussion risk and prevalence? Like what are you seeing that a lot of folks aren't aware of, um, you know, out there? Yeah, I think it's important to look at each sport. And even if you take the, the ski team, for example, within the ski team, there are so many disciplines and, and different events. Each one of those events has a set of risks. Uh, so it's really to understand uh, sort of the forces these athletes are going through. And I would say even when they do their job exactly like they should and they don't crash, uh, a lot of these disciplines come along with forces they're experiencing. And I'm thinking of, of the jumping force, the freestyle events. Uh, where even just hitting your 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 trick like you're supposed to and landing like you're supposed to, um, you know, takes a toll. And so, as as a physician, you know, I have to understand, and and all of our our team has to understand that you know we're not there just waiting around for the injury to happen. And as a side note, I'll tell you, and I've covered a lot of different sports in my in my day, and uh, a sport like football, for example, uh, the injuries are are in front of you. They're right there. Uh, you know when they happen, and there is a lot of uh, watching and vigilance. And a lot of, you know, sort of, um, I would say, time just observing the sport. When you start taking care of these athletes, you don't have a lot of time to wait around because the injuries uh, do happen uh, quickly. There are, there are, you know, people competing all across the venues, uh, training across the venues. And so injuries occur pretty, you know, you don't have to wait very long, in other words. Um, but also just during training. So we have to understand that after a day of training in the half pipe, after a day of training aerials, uh, or, or even some of our athletes in, in the sliding luge and bobsled, um, it's important to monitor them over time, check up on them even after a training run that went perfect, um, and do so 
systems and make sure that you know athletes are, are participating safely. So, you know, it's it's a it's an incredible challenge to to be able to um, to be in a position to manage all these different sports, and and it's something that I, I think as a as a fan, as somebody who's watching, just have an appreciation of what these athletes are going through, how each sport is different. Understand that what you're seeing on TV on NBC in prime time is such a small fraction of, of what that athlete has actually been through to get there. Uh, and the training is something that, that you have to be careful about uh, just as much as the competition. Indeed. And, and, you know, we have to forget, you know, we always talk about football and, you know, obviously our uh, Olympic ski teams and things like that, but from your experience clinically, you know, who are these like unsung heroes? Like, are you seeing like squash kids getting, you know, higher rates of concussion that we're not talking about because we're a not monitoring them with, you know, the um, world's first prospective study, you know, for the NCAA and DOD. Um, what are what are sports, you know, cheerleading, squash, you know, swimming and diving with slips and falls? What are you seeing in your in your clinic and in your research um, for these uh, these folks that aren't yeah, yeah. spoken about? I think that's a great point, because really, um, you mentioned cheerleading as an example and even swimming and diving. It, it's not people have these ideas that the sport is, you know, what you see on TV or what you see in a meet, but when you really stop and dissect what's going on in the field of play, understanding the sport itself, you know, getting into um, what the athlete is actually going through a sport like water polo, for example. I mean, we don't see a lot of the physical aspect of water polo if you just watch it, but it's incredibly physical game. Um, You know, I could list a couple dozen sports probably that are underappreciated. I guess I would just ask people to, step back and think about how the sport is played, how people train, um, you know, what forces uh, the athlete's brains may be exposed to, whether it's um, a ball or an object moving at a high rate of speed or the athlete moving at a high rate of speed. Um, I, I really would, would encourage people to not just think of a sport as, you know, oh, I know soccer because I've seen it on television. Um, because really in our clinic, I mean, we've seen, we see athletes, I, I have not I probably have seen an athlete from every sport you could name uh, with, with some kind of concussive injury. Mm-hmm. Indeed, especially our amateur horseback riders, right? We're we're really forgetting about them and the numbers that are oh, yeah. in with that's these guys one. are whew, yeah. out of control. That is a, that is a great that's a great example. Um, you know, the jumpers in in, in equestrian uh, high rate of injury, uh, but not talked about as much. Are you seeing, uh, you know, anecdotally and in your clinical experience, what are you seeing with like you're obviously in, uh, you know, in an Olympic event with, you know, you're talking about altitude, you know, altitude's a hot topic. Yes, we're seeing more. No, we're seeing less. We're seeing the same. You know, we're going back and forth in the literature. What are you seeing with your athletes that are experiencing concussion at altitude? I, I would say that there's an effect with altitude that I've seen clinically, um, but it's at higher altitudes. It's not Denver. It's not even you know, Boulder, it, you know, it's, it's nine, 10, 11,000 feet. Uh, you start seeing different effects and that's what we see from the climbing literature and the mountaineering literature that, um, especially if an athlete is, you know, from a park city or from a Colorado and they're uh, participating in those environments, unlikely to be an issue unless you really get high up on those, in those altitudes with the one exception that I would say altitude sickness or just altitude fatigue can, can be something that uh, mirrors concussion and post-concussion syndrome. And so it's another example of an area where you really need to understand other potential explanations for symptoms um, and make sure that you're not forgetting something that's pretty obvious right in front of you. Indeed. And I think for the most of us, you know, down here at sea level <laughs> who aren't in the altitude <laughs> world, right? Um, I think yeah. we actually we kind of see that with uh, dehydration as well. What are your thoughts there? Oh, same thing, right? So, um one of the biggest challenges that, that we all face, and once we realize that the symptoms of concussion, post-concussion syndrome, these things are not specific to that injury. There are a lot of physiological states uh, that, can, that can mimic that clinical presentation. So, you know, I always, when I, when I lecture, one of, the, one of the big messages I try to get out there is to have, you know, clinicians should not stop thinking, you know, just because concussion is in the news and somebody made a movie about it. Um, if you have an athlete who has a, a brain-related symptom who's playing a sport, don't just assume it's concussion and put them in a concussion protocol and, and, and hope that you're doing the right thing and hope they come out two weeks later or whatever. Um, give it some thought, you know, really, really dig into the physiology, dig into what that patient's going through, uh, develop a differential diagnosis. Um, that, that's how you pick up on things like dehydration or altitude effects or even uh, you know, sleep deprivation or medications or, or things that can all uh, affect how our patients present with symptoms. 
Indeed. And I think we also have to remember, we have to remember, and, and this is probably one of the most profound things that happened to me in my concussion career. Um, and I don't even have, ever know if I've actually uh, thanked Dr. Geezer for this, but I was shadowing with him over at UCLA and um, it's a few years back now. And, uh, you know, a woman came in and she was talking about, you know, she was nervous about a concussion, but, you know, he really did a comprehensive examination on her subjectively, physical and the whole nine. And we found out she didn't have a mechanism of injury. She was actually just going through a lot of life stress and crisis. Um, so I think we have to remember, like, our, our data and literature from Grant Iverson and Noah Silverberg, you know, over at Mass General and Harvard, um, you know, this physiological mimicking, even with depression, we're seeing, like, about 72% of folks with depression mimicking post-concussive, you know, symptoms. So we have to make sure we're doing, you know, we're using our, we're, we're putting our thinking caps on, right, um, as clinicians and doctors. Yeah, that's that's a great example. Um, you know, that's the same thing we do in our clinic. We see it all the time. People are, or, or they had a concussion in high school, right? And now they're in their 30s and 40s. And um, whether they have mood issues or memory issues, they sort of somebody linked it back to that time they played football, and this injury, you know, back in back when they were 17, 16 years old. Um, but you have to dig deeper than that. Indeed. And um, you know, Jeff, we've got about four minutes left here on this podcast, and I mm-hmm. I want to kind of finish up. You know, I always say, you know, when I'm speaking publicly, and, and this is obviously my platform, right, of Concussion Corner, um, we're always talking from a place of building up. But I think, you know, for folks that aren't, um, you know, seeing concussion on a regular basis, you know, can you maybe give a couple, um, you know, examples that you've seen? And, and, and my experience is that folks are seeing five to ten different providers until they find the right one. Um, so when they find me or they, maybe they, they find you, I don't know what your experience is, but, you know, they've seen five or ten. So they're their history and, and background with the healthcare experience is already kind of crappy, right? They're already kind of coming in kind of angry. Um, what are you kind of seeing from a mismanagement, again, from a place of building up, um, but from a mismanagement component of what are you seeing other folks kind of seeking out there and what's kind of out there before they find you? Well, I would say there are, are two main areas that I see. We talked about one in part one of this podcast, which is the trend right now to have people uh, cocoon themselves or rest mm-hmm. n- until they feel perfect, that kind of thing. Uh, that's still a very, very common mismanagement uh, strategy, especially for post-concussion syndrome, people who were highly active, physical, cognitively, and then, you know, told not to do anything. And then they just sort of sock into this long, drawn out um, clinical presentation because they're, they're not being active. That's, that's thing one. The other one is more general, which is uh, people who have a thing that they do. Um, and that could be vestibular therapy. That could be, you know, something to do with um, ophthalmology or headache or migraine. You, and you, you, you name it, right? The list and, goes and so on. They, yeah, yeah they, they, and, they, and that's what they do. So they, they basically patients go from one provider to the next and each provider has done one thing or, or, or considered one thing and, and offered one aspect of management. But when you have an injury that encompasses so many different aspects of brain function, dysfunction, and symptom management and production, uh, if you just have you know one approach, you just have one hammer uh, hitting that nail, um, you're going to miss. And you're, you, know, you need a comprehensive approach that takes into account all the different variables and understanding how they they each other. That's incredibly important. You can make a list of, hey, this person's got five or six reasons to have symptoms. Then comes the tough part. Right. After the two hours of talking to them to figure out what's wrong with them, then comes the tough part to understand, well, how do we break this down so that we're moving the entire clinical entity forward in a positive direction? Uh, that's something you can't do in a 20, you know, 20 minute clinic visit. Indeed. And, you know, I know Grant Iverson over at MGH um, in Harvard, he talks about he's a neuropsychologist by training and has been doing a lot of research in this area for a while. And I think we've been fortunate to have our neuropsychology friends who are PhDs who are used to publishing kind of in this realm for a while since like Jeffrey Barth in 89. Um, yep. And he says, you know, hey, you know, treat what you can treat. And then I'll take that one step further. And I think you just basically alluded to the same thing is you treat what you can treat because that's what you know, but you have to be able to screen all of these systems and make sure to refer appropriately at the right time. Um, so, you know, cause that's where a lot of folks, you know, they're just treating the the headache or they're just treating the cervical spine or they're just treating the vestibular system. And it doesn't work like that. Um, cause oftentimes these symptoms overlap and they may be masking other issues. Um, and then, yep. so, you know, one of the, the things, and I'll, I'll leave it with this quote and then we'll let the folks know where they can find you is, 
you know, when I teach it, I have to give all the credit to uh, Dr. Lorelai Lingard. She's a PhD, and she actually uh, is a rhetorician, I believe is how you say it. She actually studies language uh, of physicians in the, the OR for about 10 or 15 years for her dissertation. Uh, and again, Jeff, you can pay me to do that, but I'm glad that there are folks out there like, like Lorelai Lingard uh, up in Canada. Wow, wow. And, that's uh, incredible. Yeah, and so this is a quote that I, I completely swiped from her. It's from Kenneth Burke, and he's an American literary theorist, and we'll leave our listeners with this. But a way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. And I think that's so powerful. I'm just going to say it again. A way of seeing is also a way of not seeing. So remember, whatever specialty that you're in, just make sure that you need to look at this from a 30,000-foot view versus your, your tunnel vision of your, your clinical day. So um, any thoughts on that, Jeff? That's a that's a fantastic quote. I love that. I'm, I'm going to start using that because that is, summarizes a lot of this in, in just a few words. That's yeah. really great. Th- yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah, and you definitely, yeah, you, you set me up on the T for that one. You couldn't have done that any better. <laughs> yeah, you weren't aware. Um, so where can our listeners find you? You know, what's the, what's the best way to reach out, um, you know, through social media and then also clinically, you know, what's the best way? Uh, no, yep, we are out there on the internet like everybody else, uh, but it, the sports are- uh, I am on Twitter. I'm not uh, an incredibly active. I'm not like you. I, I don't tweet as much as you, or Giza, but I'm, I'm on, I'm on uh, directly via that mechanism at Jeff Kutcher and D. Um, but also on, on the internet, you, you can find ways to contact us. Uh, but we do a lot of, um, you know, curbside consultations with people shadowing us in clinic all the time, from physical therapists, athletic trainers, physicians, uh, medical students, regular students. Um, so you know, our mission is to raise the bar of, of neurological expertise in this area, and we'll do whatever it takes to get that accomplished. Awesome. And I can't tell our listeners that's just an invaluable experience if you ever get the opportunity to do that. And again, I know we were having some audio issues there. So his Twitter handle is at Jeff Kutcher, M-D, J-E-F-F-K-U-T-C-H-E-R-M-D. Uh, and his email is jeffrey.kutcher at the sports neurology clinic.com. And um, his website is sports neurology clinic.com. And I'll make sure to set up links for American Academy of Neurology, their concussion tool, uh, tool re- and resource center, and also um, a link to his book back in the game for Amazon. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for being oh, on thank, concussion thank corner. You, <laughs> oh, no, thank, thank you for doing what you're doing. And this is, uh, it's an honor to be on this and um, anything any I can do to help. Awesome. Well, have a great day and good luck in Pyeongchang. Okay. Thanks, Jess. Talk to you soon. Thank you for listening to the Concussion Corner, hosted by Dr. Jessica Schwartz. The information in this podcast is for entertainment purposes only and not to be used as personal medical advice. Don't forget to follow us on social media on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube at Concussion Corner.